All right, now welcome to the stage, John Adams, to tell us all about the unsung heroes of human spaceflight. Thank you very much. All right, let's see if I can still remember how to use a mic stand. Fantastic, all right. In October of 1957, Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union. Science! Once every 96 minutes, it orbited the Earth and it transmitted a boop. That signal could be picked up by even the simplest receiver that you could build. And the surprise success precipitated the American Sputnik crisis and triggered the space race, a part of the Cold War. The launch itself ushered in new political, military, technological, and scientific developments on both sides. Science? There's going to be a lot of that. So. Um, and Yuri Gagarin soon followed Sputnik into space, and he became the first astronaut. Sorry, America. Cosmonaut. He's like, oh, cosmonaut. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you. So on November 25th, 1957, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson began hearings on American space and, and what we were doing in space, and they decided to create NASA. And that happened on February 6th, 1958, in a special Senate committee. Um, this was really incredible because it came sort of from this thing called NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which was actually in Langley, Virginia, and had nothing to do with Florida or Houston, we have a problem, or any of those things. Um, and, you know, Alan B. Shepard finally became one of the first Americans to go into suborbital flight. And then in 1961, and I, I almost have to do this because I'm from Boston, but it's like, you know, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hot. So, thank you. There you go. And the important thing to realize, and as we talk about risk, um, is that all of these accomplishments were incredibly risky. It's so easy to die in space. Like, here's Neil Armstrong having this amazing flight in the lunar module, and he narrowly escaped, so yay, Neil. Good work. Um, and liftoff, of course, is especially dangerous. Uh, those of you around my age probably remember the Challenger explosion, which was an incredibly sad day. And, you know, Richard Feynman, the noted physicist, eventually determined that the failure occurred because of the O-rings got frozen and things exploded, and it was bad. And, you know, once you get into space, it's even easier to die. So you can get lost in space, which is not a good movie, but probably a good TV series. You can have your spacesuit fail, you can decompress, and not in the Burning Man way. Uh, you can have a control failure, or you can actually catch on fire, in which case you become Burning Man, and you don't complete the mission. Or you could just explode on the pad. It's, it's, it's really insanely dangerous and risky. Um, and also, like, if your amazing adventure comes to an end, you might actually try to go home, and as, sadly, the Columbia astronauts found out, sometimes your heat shield can fail during re-entry, and this caused a serious thermal event in 2003. So, I think the thing to understand is that before you get your chance to die as an astronaut, <laughs> you need to understand that no matter how much you train, no matter how much you work, you're just a small, very visible rock star of a very large team. And the people responsible for mitigating risk and for ensuring that your mission succeeds exactly as you intend are the brave men and women of mission control. And starting way back in Project Mercury in 1958, just a couple of weeks after NASA's enactment, this set of people, you know, they were energized by a common goal, by a common mission, and they were capable at the time of doing anything that America asked them to do in space. And, you know, each team was about 50 people working nine-hour shifts, and there are incredible numbers of engineering people uh, who support the mission. Like, you know, if you look at Odd Salon, we got some engineering people supporting this mission right here. Yeah. Steen! I'm over there, too. It's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So each team actually had a, had, a, had a person named Capcom, and Capcom was an astronaut who trained with the other people. And like, if you're on the outside of this, as far as you were concerned, it's just like long series of engineering miracles are coming out of this magician's lair in the middle of Florida. But the reality was is that they were threatening, uh, well, not threatening, they were, they were fixing life-threatening after life-threatening problems over and over and over again, just so this mission could happen and go home. Uh, Back in, uh, back in the early days of uh, NASA, uh, Christopher Kraft was the, he was the brains behind mission control. And he actually sort of invented that very classic mission control look, and I'm, I'll have a lot of photos of that in a minute, because it looks like every single operation center you've ever seen. Um, he would become the first flight director, 
And you know, he once said that the combination of the two, having a crew in space and men on the ground, allowed them to get so much more done than they ever could get done before. Um, he kind of came up with this pattern for mission control. The people that sat in the front, they lived in, and they actually called it the trench. So it's kind of like going to war. You know, you had to go through and make sure that the mission was going to succeed. And it took 14 flight controllers to make this happen. And inside a mission command center, they had eight primary functions, you know, to direct flight, make sure the crew would stay healthy, make a decision to abort, and make all of the decisions to keep the tracking stations and everything else updated. So this was the very early uh, Mercury uh, Command Center. And you know, the idea was is that they would put this in Florida because if they ever had to ditch a mission, they could just ditch it into the ocean. The mild climate and lack of people, except for maybe like old retirees, probably made it into a good place to launch things. Um, the MCC was actually part of this massive data tracking network because as the Earth turns, and, and you have to believe the Earth turns, right? So as the Earth turns, <laughs> So as the, as the Earth science, as the Earth turns, uh, every, you had a number of ships that would track the position, ships, 18 ground stations and people around the world to keep track of things. And, you know, later even the Russians got involved. So this is like, this is their uh, command center, but, you know, ours is a lot nicer. So this is the modern day MCC. This is actually the MCC that controls the, uh, the ISS. Um, but, you know, not all things were without failure. Like, as we learned from Apollo 1, uh, you could die in training. And unfortunately, there was a fire during a, a normal training operation. And sadly, uh, you know, these three men, G Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, they, they, they died on, on, the, on the pad. And manned Apollo flights were suspended for 20 months while they tried to fix this problem. And the thing is, Gene Krantz became the, the, he was the flight director at the time of, of Apollo. And he said that from the day forward from that accident, that flight control would only be known by two words, tough and competent. And tough would mean that they're forever accountable for what they do or what they will do or what they fail to do and that they will never, ever compromise a mission. And competent meant that they would never take anything for granted. You know, uh, the, they assumed that the, uh, the module would be safe, but unfortunately a spark in a pure oxygen environment equals death. Um, later, you know, bridging the gap, they had the Gemini mission. Uh, they built out the, the complex further to add more rooms and more engineers, and they had to add more computers to deal with the problem. And of course, you have more power in your pocket now than, than they had on the ground. And all this work was being done by people with slide rules and big, giant IBM computers. So they were building databases before they existed. They were building multi-user, uh, multi-real-time operating systems before they existed, and computers small enough to fit inside uh, the Saturn rocket at, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, which is just incredible. Um, and, you know, eventually uh, they, they did have to tear down uh, mission control and rebuild it into more of a Disneyland style experience because the building was falling apart. But it, it, it truly was a remarkable and historic place. Um, they only really ever had two failed missions, Apollo 1 and of course Apollo 13. And Apollo 13, and many people are familiar with that because of the 1995 Ron Howard movie. But, you know, H Howard actually said that the film is a dramatization and not a, uh, not a documentary. So a lot of the things were not as you expected. Um, a lot of people don't know that uh, Gene Krantz was a big fan of, uh, of vests. So you odd salon people, you are, you're doing great on that. He had a flat top uh, a haircut, and he was the one who quoted the phrase, failure is not an option. Okay, so it's a great book. You should read it. The other thing is I want to just show you real quickly as, as we kind of near the end of my talk the amount of decisions that they made in a very short amount of time on Apollo 11. I think this slide starts at uh, uh, 5554 and within uh, by 142. So in the span of just a few short hours, they had to make many, many decisions to save the lives of the astronauts of Apollo 13. And, you know, they, they sat in mission control, they agonized over the problem, they MacGyvered up a solution real quick to build a, a CO2 scrubber, which is basically putting a round peg in a square hole, and they saved the crew with their quick thinking. And you can see them just agonizing here, the, the drawn faces of all the flight controllers going, please, I hope this works, I hope this works. And you know, they made an improvised filter for Apollo 13, held it together with duct tape, which can do anything, by the way. <laughs> And they save, they save their lives. And Mission Control is still a remarkable place. And I want to make a toast to all the brave men and women of Mission Control who have allowed us to do amazing science and save 
Thank you. And save the future for the rest of us. Yeah. Cheers. Oh, man. Thank you so much, John. All right, now, I'd like to take this moment to talk to you about our good Lord, Savior, Harvey. So Harvey is our little mascot here at Odd Salon, and he likes to go on adventures. He likes to travel the world. We're actually building a map where all of the places uh, where Adventure Harvey goes. So if you have an Adventure Harvey, which you can purchase over at our merch table, uh, we have a special one tonight. This little guy, our risky Harvey, uh, he's set up for a, a night of gambling in Las Vegas, <laughs> clearly. Uh, anyways, you can take a picture of your Harvey wherever he might be in the world. And if you tag that picture with hashtag Adventure Harvey, we will share the photos here. So let's see where Harvey's been lately. Here is Harvey in Paris at the Panthenon, lamenting a lack of a pendulum. There's no pendulum. Foucault's pendulum will not be visible for a few days. Invisible pendulum. Uh, a little bit more local. Here he is enjoying that late San Francisco summer clearly not taken this week because it's finally raining. Here's, I don't know which version of Harvey this is. Maybe this older can... Oh, this is Schrodinger's Harvey. <laughs> well, here's Schrodinger's Harvey enjoying some street art in Berlin. And then Harvey checking out the new statue dedicated to Katherine Johnson at West Virginia State College. So we rely on your support to make this whole crazy thing happen, whether it's buying a Harvey or buying any of the other fine things that we have our, at our merch table over there. I see Dan and Christina. Yeah, woo, give a round of applause to them. Uh, they are selling t-shirts and hoodies. Uh, we are out of the glassware, unfortunately, but that will be here probably in the next salon. And we have adventure Harveys, regular Harveys, buttons, stickers, all the swag that you could possibly want, including advanced discount tickets for the next salon. So we're going to take a short cocktail break here. And when we come back, we're going to be giving this little guy away. So if you haven't filled out a raffle ticket, too late. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to be drawing. We're going to be drawing those tickets when we come back for our little cocktail break. We'll also have three more stories. We'll have stories of risk and the industrial revolution in China, a story of competitive fighting throughout the ages, complete with a stunt performed by yours truly. <laughs> Really not sure how I'm feeling about this whole thing. And last but not least, story of a risk-taking magician. So get on up, go to the bar, get a cocktail, and we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. Woo!